I saw I go around talking with enterprises and the service providers. A major challenge for users is to avoid cost R in single vendor approach. You know, if we learn anything, we learn from the uh, old days, the ERP, CRM days, is that you want to leave yourself more options. Multi vendor approach, a technology that extensible, flexible, especially in the world of IoT, given it's an evolving business case, evolving use cases. Now we got a 5G breathing down our neck. So a lot of things still unimaginable today as you and I are sitting here, but uh, gonna be become a reality. So um, <clears throat> you want to select a technology that's open, standards-based uh, platform, a multi-vendor support, and uh, give you the flexibility. Steve, now I'm gonna turn to you. Your firm has done some work in this area. Please go ahead, tell us what you find. Sure, Will. I mean, I think this is a really important challenge um, for managing IoT devices at scale, right? So fact of the matter is that most enterprise deployment and pretty much 100% of every service provider deployment involves heterogeneous devices, right? So, I mean, if you think about sort of the typical deployment approach at the enterprise, it's, you know, uh, you know, come up with an IoT strategy, a series of tactics, sort of your business KPIs you're gonna measure, create a POC, right? At some point, prove the POC from a technology perspective and then move forward into, you know, a pilot or further, right? But that's really just the first stage. Um, enterprise, you know, the first IoT solution in an enterprise spawns the second and the third and the fourth solution. Right. And, and so these deployments end up having heterogeneous devices. And so being able to support all those different devices on the same protocol becomes really important from a financial perspective, from a technology perspective. We've talked a lot about that, but from a financial perspective, you know, running multiple protocols and multiple platforms can be a challenge, you know, to make sure that the, the business is going to make its ROI. Secondly, as enterprises layer on more IoT solutions, the first, the second, the third, the fourth, the device management requirements do increase. Um, you know, while it's true that a lot of the um, inherent technology and capabilities inside a horizontal platform can supply most of the device requirements um, needed, um, you know, each solution has some unique little bells and whistles that require um additional capabilities and that that can increase um the requirements of the device management solution and thirdly as will you were, you were just saying you know enterprises and service providers are concerned about being tied to one device vendor uh, or one software vendor and in the case where you've got proprietary protocol proprietary development being done on devices so the 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 the, um, the software, the protocols, the, the firmware being used on the devices where everything is protocol, where everything is proprietary, uh, you end up being tied, you know, to one device vendor, or software vendor, and that that is a real problem um, uh, moving forward. I mean, in theory, you know, enterprises and service providers want the flexibility to be able to port, you know, a protocol from one device to another device. Right, a matching device from a different vendor. Similarly, from one software platform to another platform. Well, let me ask you this, Steve. That's a good point you just made. Uh, do you observe as a research firm any differences uh, or approaches uh, between different verticals? Like, you know, say healthcare versus uh, transportation. I'm just picking some names from there. Over there, <laughs> they try. Yeah. Oh, that's a really good question, Will. So, in the case of device management, the differences are generally not vertical to vertical. Interestingly enough, now for data management and analytics and at the stuff higher up in the stack, absolutely there are vertical differences. But when it comes to device management, you know what the biggest difference is. Um, in terms of requirements and the way you deploy and implement, 
It's really around the type of device. So there's a big difference between um, how one thinks about device management for very low power, low processing devices, right? That don't have any edge capabilities that basically sort of beep on, you know, send a little flit of data and sort of turn off, right? That kind of device is really different from a device management perspective than, you know, a heavy um, edge based um, uh, uh, device, you know, that's doing a lot of process at the edge and running applications at the edge and having high requirements. So that, that's a really interesting question. That, that's really the differences for device management. It's not really a, 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 um, a horizontal, it's not really a, a, a vertical industry thing. So it's more use case driven. You want to track, uh, but there's a difference between, you mentioned earlier, the word ocean scared me a little bit. So if I have to be the one, the technician go update a device in the ocean. So don't send me uh, for sure. Uh, but also thinking the use case of that versus uh, updating a, a device up in the Himalayas. <laughs> so that. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a good point. I mean, there's a difference between, you know, a little low power device that's sitting, um, you know, in, in a parking garage or on the floor of a parking garage monitoring whether a car is there or not versus a device that's sitting on a factory floor, um, you know, attached to a PLC, delivering huge amounts of, you know, robotics data, right? Doing a lot of processing of the robotics data and then sending a lot of, and then sending some of it back to the cloud for other types of analytics. So that, those are the big differences, I think, for device management. It's exactly right. Excellent point. Greg, you got something to add to this? Yeah, of course. Uh, so from my experience, um, I don't see many people which which uh, wonder about these issues at the beginning, at least. Um, so usually you have a developer which need, needs to to perform a POC, so so he or she can get one of the device um, software development kits, um, and a software embed, embedded developer can use a ready to use solution, but usually um, this forces user or company at the end to use a specific platform and corresponding device SDK. So while many platforms on the market provide some kind of auto discovery, which is a very, very good uh, feature because you simply plug a device in and it show up in your inventory among with all, all, all the features. Uh, let's focus now on how it is possible to, to, to add also interoperability to auto discovery. In general, we have two ways. Some platform, platform uh, vendors define digital twins. So digital twins are usually defined as virtual device models. So uh, such, such a model can de define some device capabilities and even bindings to the communication protocols. But it only allows you to use auto discovery because this solution will work only with a specific platform. But definitions are not um, compliant with other platforms. So that said, so let's now turn on to the next slide and see the yeah. live M2M way. Yeah, before we see the new way, uh, next slide, let me uh, let me ask you, so Steve just mentioned uh, here, <clears throat> this, uh, you know, uh, vendor lockdown, the impact is you end up with uh, uh, each implementation becomes a one-off yeah. customized effort, as you just pointed it out. And that's a, a huge waste of time and money. And uh, it's just simply not scalable, especially we're coming to the world of IoT, right? So uh, that, that's, uh, the, I, I'm really looking forward to what you have to say about the, the new way of, uh, of doing it. Okay, let's go on. Okay, so please note that the Lightning M2M protocol does not only provide a convention for, for interchanging messages between devices, such as, such as device management operations, FOTA, configuration change, um, and, and, and enabling observations. So it's also suitable for, for, for telemetry. Uh, but also there is Open Mobile Alliance Lightweight M2M Object and Resource Registry. Uh, lightweight M2M Object is defined in a single file. It's XML file, but it's, it's a very, very simple definition. So you specify capabilities of a device, data format, for, for communication between the platform and the device. And moreover, this registry is public. So if you have some not standard requirements, 
you may define your own private objects. But if you want to implement an asset tracker, it's very, very likely that you simply need to open that Open Mobile Alliance registry and compose your device of uh, ready to use blocks. So this is like, like um, we have modul modular way of defining devices. Um, objects can have and uh, objects can have versions, and uh, so you can upgrade your devices using uh, new definitions. And if you public your own definition of uh, capabilities such as temperature or, or location, there are many mandatory objects as well, like like the M2M server definition, um, connectivity monitoring. They have many useful uh, resources already implemented. Um, so that's it. If you public your definition, any platform vendor can 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 implement uh, your object as well. So it's very likely that your device, your new service, will also be compliant with any other uh, platform. So this this is true interoperability. And what we uh, what we experienced at AV System, we observed some customers who simply connected a device and it worked out of the box. It, it was probably a weather station um, last week, which which was plug, plugged in, and and we were able to use all the features uh, on the device. No development at, at the platform side. 